let's start. There should be like an applause thing. Let's start today's webinar. Uh, surface and confirm buggy patterns in your logs without slow search. So thank you for showing up. Let's do some intros. Um, Andy, since I'm wild, you're Andy. Maybe Andy, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do here at Honeycomb, what your background is, and what you're interested in talking about today. Yeah. Uh, yes, I am Andy. Uh, nice to see y'all. Thanks everyone for for coming today. Uh, excited to talk about logging and what you can do with your logs inside of Honeycomb. Um, uh, I'm I, I work on our customer success team here at Honeycomb. If you haven't worked with the CS team, we're essentially uh, a uh the post sales team so after you you have your deal with honeycomb we uh we engage with you and and try to get you through your your journey with observability and that often includes getting some logs in honeycomb so uh you know we've got some experience on that on the side before that if you've been in the uh devops community at all i spent about seven years at chef uh with a few different roles and with rob campbell who has kindly showed up to heckle us i'm sure um but uh the uh and, and other people here at Honeycomb as well uh, have come from Chef, but uh, spent seven years at Chef uh, as in customer success as a customer success engineer, uh, et cetera. And before that, when it was still a thing, I was at BlackBerry for about five years as a web engineer, DevOps engineer, site reliability engineer. Uh, uh, you know, we didn't have some of those words to call it that back in 2010, but essentially those kinds of roles. So uh, that probably takes me back far enough. And uh yeah I, mean, awesome. I think there's there's tons of value you can get out of having logs in honeycomb i just want to wanted to talk about that and make sure people are are kind of aware and we can have a really cool discussion and wild with your background that you're about to go through i'm super excited to be able to sit here and talk to you about it and and all these fine people thanks andy i'm excited to see everybody over there in the attendee list but hey rob campbell what's up smart cookie um hey i'm wild uh i check out this job title that i have at honeycomb called account exec what is it was my major job i sell the things and andy helps us uh, our customers work with the things but it's it's a little bit of a deceptive title given my background um most of my life is spent in uh maybe pre-sales or technical or ops roles or i've been an sre but um i helped bring the log search world to uh, to to your everyday life. I was Splunk's first sales engineer back in 2006 and was with the company from 2006 to 2018. Um, if you were to Google the word Splunk Ninja, you would find my face come up with it. And I really, when I came to work at Honeycomb back in 2018, I uh, was super excited, but not, a, not just about distributed tracing, but the approach that we have at Honeycomb focused on analytics, and uh, as anybody works with me knows, I'm pretty savvy at tech stuff, product, and uh, and Honeycomb as well. So that's a little bit about me. That's a little bit about Andy. Um, while this could go on for hours, <laughs> let's uh, let's get into our uh, discussion today. Uh, what do you say? There we go. Let's do it. Um, so uh, as two ops people or former ops people sitting up here talking to, to y'all, I'm going to make a joke that part of this part of this attendee list will get and and some of them will not. But uh, people ask me why I'm still using Vim. It's because I can't quit. Uh, but I'm All right. There we go. Well, starting off in, in good style. Uh, <laughs> Call it X, man. It's not that hard. <laughs> It's really not hard. I know. Yeah. I, I, saw that, I saw that on Twitter today. Uh, I just thought it was funny. So nice. Um, cool. So, so, Hey, uh, you end up in an incident. What do you do? Um, and even if you don't know it, you probably have some sort of troubleshooting methodology that you follow, whether that's starting at your web logs and working your way back, whether you actually follow the use-based troubleshooting method. Uh, if you've never heard of Brendan Gregg, he's, uh, a person that's been involved in, in systems troubleshooting for many years. He has uh, really influenced the way I look at incidents and the way that I investigate and look at, at things in systems. Uh, definitely encourage you to check check things out. But, you know, that use-based uh, methodology can be summarized as for every resource, you check utilization, saturation, and errors. And uh, it really says that you should construct a checklist, which for server analysis can be used for quickly identifying resource bottlenecks or errors. And it begins by posing questions and then seeks answers instead of starting with some given metrics or like a dashboard based on a previous uh, set of incidents and trying to work backwards from that. Um, 
and when when it comes down to it that's really what honeycomb tries to do right we we want to consume your data and we want you to be able to ask questions of it we want you to be able to analyze it we want you to be able to make use of it and you might be asking questions like what endpoint is emitting the slowest responses what's unique about this group of slow responses or requests uh, is this data relevant or a red herring and where can I focus my investigation into a set of bottlenecks? Uh, you might want to ask your logs those kinds of questions. Yeah, I, I kind of often also say like um, log search is awesome because it allows us to ask any freeform question that very quickly after we get even the first set of answers, all the questions become analytical in nature. And, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about and show and how we can kind of maybe flip the script on that and think about using analytics first. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is uh, this is a funny uh, sort of graphic we have that uh, I actually don't know who originated this, but it, it floats around internally a bit. But you may have some dashboards that you've based on pre previous incidents. If you're lucky, the current issue will be correlated closely enough with the previous issue that the institutional knowledge you have uh, and existing things that you've created will point you in the right direction. If not, you may be forced to dig into your logs. Um, usually this results in some sort of log search. This could be, a, be via a command line or a logging tool like Elk uh, or Splunk. Or uh, maybe you've gotten really good at grep aux sort type commands. Maybe you're a, a Splunk power user. Uh, or know how to create custom fields and indices in Elasticsearch, and, and you really can get some of these answers from it. Uh, or perhaps you're lucky enough that the incident you're having is closely correlate, correlated enough to a previous incident that uh, that you can use those dashboards that you have. But there are a lot of times that this isn't true, and finding a single slow endpoint can end up being an exercise in futility, or trying to track down the cause of a slow endpoint can be as well. You ever seen some stuff like this, Andy? You ever done things like this? Oh, I've uh, I've written too many oxed grep commands sure. in my life for sure. Yeah, uh, I can I can picture. And it's and it's awesome. Like it, it's it awesome. I, I gotta say, like it like being able to string together a set of logic to process to find things right to process them to pull knowledge out of them to ask further questions. There's something cool about the power to be able to do that and. Uh, and, and the same thing in search as well. For sure. Uh, how long does it take you to figure out how to write one of these though, Wild? Let's say let's say you haven't didn't work at Splunk for 12 years. How long do you think it would it would take you well, to figure out how to write one? Well, first of all, um, I would refer to the awk manual first, uh, because there's a all of the Unix commands I'm pretty good at, but I always forget how to use them. So I would do that first. But seriously though. If I was using a log search engine, um, some of the more sophisticated things um, might take a little bit longer to learn, even though there are some helper functions in most log products, which are cool. And, and also, you know, the, the basic, I guess the real question that we will often ask is, you kind of, where the heck do I start? Right? Because, um, all log search engines are, you know, kind of raw data first, which is totally cool, right? Just like grep or even, you know, any Unix command is raw data first. But um, I kind of have to have a priori knowledge of what I can search on or what I want to search on to get the first pile of data. And aside from complex search commands, which are really powerful, like, the eval ones on the screen allow you to do things that are kind of similar to Honeycomb's derived columns. They let you make brand new fields or the transaction command, uh, if you're a Splunk user, allows you to aggregate events, not in a statistical way, but more like group them together, kind of like we just do with traces. But how do I even know where to start? Right? And that's, that's kind of one of the things I sort of discovered when I came. To work at honeycomb on what we could do yeah um, i'll second that and say like uh you know I, I knew what honeycomb was but i hadn't been a direct user of it and when i started interviewing here back in december of last year i, I used it for the first time and saw my first bubble up and kind of was like mind blown and and uh just kind of uh 
thought how much I wanted this uh, previous job. So um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about what Bubble Up is and and how you can utilize some of that in a in a little bit here. But we have a little bit more to talk about around locks. Yeah, for sure. Um, I I wrote a blog post. I'll post it in a little bit because my hands are kind of tied sharing the screen. Back in 2019, called the true cost of search first problem solving, and um, uh, my last job before Honeycomb, I was an SRE actually that's garbage. I was a, a premium support tech or a principal support tech. Uh, everyone just took the SRE job title and SRE is a real thing. All the SREs that are out there, it's a little bit different than support. But that said, um, I worked uh, with a large number of uh, Splunk's biggest customers and that was cool. And as a user of log products, I was an expert, which was awesome. Um, but I always kind of um, felt that I wish that the folks that weren't experts could could kind of learn and, and be as smart as, as, you know, or as capable as I was with, with that as well. But this, you know, the whole thing about search is it's just easy because it parallels on the on how we find things on Google and our favorite search engine. Andy's is probably Bing. Um, but uh, metrics or... Um, aggregating data is a second order operation. So to really understand the behavior of the data, I have to retrieve the data first, duh, because that's what you do in a database. But you then also have to like figure out the right search or the right query or the right time range. And then what's the second question that you should answer? And that I think is almost the hardest part because you can type in the word failed or error and or not prod and not debug. And you probably, if you're a, you've already created some bookmarks and you've already created some event types and all of that. Just the idea of, um, of basically uh, making it, it's kind of difficult to understand the behavior if you don't know the questions that you should ask. And oh, you know, everyone knows the questions they should ask, right, Andy? Everyone does. Of course. Uh, you already pre know all the questions you might have to ask of your system during an incident. That's not a, there's never an unknown unknown, as we would like to say. Um, yeah, um, really that era of, hey, we want to search our logs gave, gave rise to this group of companies like Splunk, LogLogic, SumoLogic, Elk, uh, or elastic and and many others and uh, logging became the standard practice to output telemetry from production systems it's easy everyone already knows how to log there's a standard logging library in every uh, main every mainstream programming language that's out there um, but as systems got larger and more complex log data volume started to skyrocket um, as a result search and indexing so software was a natural choice to access and process the semi-structured log data arbitrarily created by developers um, in of production systems. And this is really what, what we mean when we say the log era, the log search era is when we have this plethora of companies that are searching log data and developers that are pumping all of their telemetry data into logs, whether that's the right place to have it or not. Yeah, totally. And, and, and you know, it's not to say that like, this era will end, right? Um, you know, we develop software from day one and look at console output. And, you know, when most people don't use a search engine on their machine to like search the logs from the code they just wrote, um, it's still a great feedback mechanism. But we think that the tooling could be a little bit better. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So, um, if any, one in this webinar has had anything to do with Honeycomb or seen a Honeycomb demo or read things that charity majors or Liz Fung Jones have talked about. You might know that Honeycomb, the company, and a lot of our customers do distributed tracing, but you'd be surprised. We have logs in Honeycomb. How? What logs? Well, we have a real common one is a uh, Amazon ALB ELB logs. Now there's not a huge amount of them because we instrument our stuff for uh, distributed tracing, but we use it. Now, Andy, like what if we had sent 
uh, you know, what if the people on the on the line here had sent their logs to Honeycomb? What might it be like? Yeah, well, let's let's take a look at what the data actually is uh, here on the next slide. But um, you know, like uh, like Wild said, we actually do send our ELB logs into Honeycomb. Um, I'm only showing a few fields here. There's some stuff we need to redact because uh, it might have customer information and things like that in it. So we don't want to show everything. But you know, the all of the log lines that exist in an ELB uh, will exist here as well. You, you can get the same kind of data out of HA proxy. Nginx Apache logs, and uh, they're kind of structured to begin with, right? When you when you write an Apache or an Nginx log line, it's got a pretty st standard set of things like timestamp, uh, URL that was requested, type of HTTP operation, user agent, uh, duration of the request. Uh, it has a lot of the information that you actually want to be able to look at and dissect and analyze uh, in order to be able to make uh, educated statements on your system. Um, and that's without instrumenting anything. You you can just pump in your uh, uh, load balancer, web server logs into Honeycomb, and you can take advantage of a lot of great things like bubble up. So, so we could have a slow endpoint and be investigating something and not necessarily need to know everything about the system or how to write a really complex search in order to find out what part of the system is slow. And we'll Show a quick example of that here in a sec. Yeah, uh, I I um I love that you brought up this uh, screen because um it's often that when I watch people use Honeycomb or we kind of take a look at how they use it, sometimes this is the first thing they do. They'll do a count or they'll just click on the raw data tab because they either can't find the search button in Honeycomb because there isn't one but they need to kind of look at what's in the data to figure out what they're going to ask questions at. And that's one of the things that I find really cool about using bubble up, right? So this is, er, we're taking the search idea and turning it on its head and helping you use analytics to ask a whole bunch of questions. Um, how do you like using bubble up? What do you see about it? That is a really, really cool, Andy. Yeah, uh, in this case, we can actually take a look at it. And I'm going to steal the screen share from you for a couple minutes. Yeah, go for it. Please do. So we can actually show Honeycomb here. And let's take a look. So this is actually a query that we ran against our ELB access logs. Uh, you can see up here, this is a data set that says AWS ELB access logs. Uh, and this is in our dog food environment where we monitor Honeycomb ourselves. Um, and we've done two things. We've shown a count number of requests coming in, as well as uh, heat map duration milliseconds. So essentially, out of our logs, we've created a couple things here. One is uh, a heat map of how long requests are taking into our systems, uh, and then also just the number of raw events that are coming in uh, through this. And uh, let's say we had some errors and we wanted to know what was causing them. We can actually click the uh, context menu here for 500s, and we can choose bubble up compare ELB status code 500 to all other events. And we'll actually run a bubble up on that and we'll compute. We'll go through what bubble up is in a, in a second, but essentially we're computing what's in the set of requests versus what's outside of it in the baseline. Um, and you know, we can see a couple of things here, like everything's coming from a specific set of user agents, uh, a specific client IP as well. If we come down here and look at user agents, we can actually see that one of these is libhoney java 1.3.1. So let's say we just had a release of uh, libhoney java and suddenly we're getting a bunch of 500 errors. This would give us a pretty good clue that, hey, maybe this is causing us an issue, right? And, and this was out without knowing a whole lot about uh, our data schema or anything like that, just draw essentially asking the question, what's what is common about the 500 errors that we're seeing in our logs? Um, another thing we can do is we can actually draw a box around duration. And you can see here, we've got like a band of requests that are coming in about 60,000 milliseconds, which usually tells me uh, that, hey, we're hitting, hitting a 60 second timeout somewhere in our system. and uh, this is as simple as you can go to bubble up, you can draw a box around a set of requests that you're interested in. And again, we're going to do the analytics on this to compare what's in the box versus all of the requests outside of the box and what's common with them. 
And you can see there's a common error. Uh, so we can see the backend processing time. There's a malformed response coming back. Uh, and again, we've got a common user agent. And in this case, we've got libhoney.net. So we could also uh, use that as a route for investigation. Is there something with our .NET library that's causing issues? Is there uh, something going on there? But we can also see on the bottom right, and I'm not going to hover over it uh, just to not publish someone's IP, but uh, on the bottom right here, we've got client IP in the bottom right, and you can see there's a massive spike there. Um, and just to make sure that the bottom of the Zoom window isn't covering that up, I'll move it down a bit. Um, there's a massive spike in one client IP. So we could also assume that it's a single customer. And again, this is without me trying to ask, like, is this one customer? Is this one user agent? This is simply Honeycomb do, do, doing the analytics on our ELB access logs to decide uh, what's different about these versus the rest of our requests. That is a lot. That seems like magic. I feel like we should probably drill into how that thing you just did works and what is really great about it. Sound like a plan? That sounds like a plan. Okay. All right, let's do that. Because um, we we have some good slides on that. Um, if you're a Honeycomb user, like, oh, yeah, maybe you hadn't thought about using Bubble Up for, um, for logs. Um, but we have a lot of folks that the first place they go isn't Bubble Up. And it's really, uh, truly a magic. Um, bubble up is truly magic. Hang on a second. Let me it go really here. Is, yeah, it Let's is. Fix this so that you can see. Uh, my screen's good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We're great. Good. Um. So, you know, when you were talking, Andy, I thought um, what you were doing with bubble up, <clears throat> which was really you could say comparative analysis on a lot of dimensions none of them which you knew about in advance is actually kind of what people do when they're problem solving, right? They're trying to identify, they, they key off of something, right? Whether it's, you know, I, I think there's a, only two states of software. There's works, there's, there's um, fast and broken, okay? So they'll key off of of error or they'll key off of a number or they'll key off of a specific pod or cluster, and then start to look for things that are kind of, you know, good versus bad. And that's a totally subjective thing in anybody's mode. Um, but that, you know, you were just using uh, bubble up uh, to, to kind of compare status codes uh, of this uh, particular result set. Um, Tell me a little bit more about how Bubble Up is actually doing what it's doing, how I get to it, and, and what the best place to start is on it. Yeah. Um, so uh, essentially, Bubble Up is what you're talking about. It's statistic an analysis. Um, anytime you draw a heat map, you can go over to the Bubble Up tab, and you can draw a box around a group of requests that you want to get details into. <clears throat> As well, anytime you've got a result set. So anytime you run a query, and there's results at the bottom of your screen inside of Honeycomb. You can click the context menu and choose bubble up. Um, yeah, if you go ahead, probably one more. Uh, we live demoed some of this and we had slides to cover this too. But um, you can see the uh, when you go into any context menu now inside of Honeycomb, bubble up, compare ELB status code equals 500 to all other events. That's what I uh, ended up doing in that case to, to unearth what might be going on. Um, but at the end of the day, once you run this, BubbleUp explains how a subset of data differs from other data in the query set that you're looking at and the results that you're looking at. With BubbleUp, you visually select a set of data points from the heat map, uh, compare it to the remaining data, and then investigate this comparison with visual charts. These are the visual charts that you're investigating with. Um, this is showing, again, you know, hey, you've got one client IP that is causing a hundred percent of your uh of your errors in this case um that that is a a big indicator that hey maybe you have a, a client that's in a geo that you're not supporting maybe they have a slow link um and and you can use that to determine okay our platform isn't impacted across the board we have one client ip that is having issues connecting to us values that contrast provide answers or additional fields to explore like you said wild it's it's this is what you would do as a human you would chase down one bottleneck try to determine is that the thing that's going wrong 
if you decide no, you'd surface back up to the beginning, create a new search, look at the next search result, determine, hey, is this the thing that's wrong? Uh, and and you'd have to cycle through many iterations of that. And we try to provide that analysis for you really quickly here. Yeah, I, I also look at bubble up is a great way to take a shortcut through data, or sometimes I like to say cheat. Um, you Most people know that when you want to ask a question of a system, you need to understand its schema, right? Whether it's a database or a log system, uh, a database or a search engine. On the web, you can pretty much understand any word is going to appear there. And, you know, in a, in a log search system, you're going to have a subset of words that are related to technical things. But, you know, as we've been asking developers uh, and ops folks to instrument their code, or maybe libraries that they're using have been upgraded, and they've putting out structured logs. It's one of the things we did at Splunk for a very long time, is to help people um, move their logging to maybe key value pairs or or um, JSON or something like that so that systems could process it because all this text parsing based on regular expressions, which I happen to weirdly enjoy, um, this is a lot of extra work, right? Um, and, and all of that. But you can walk into, you know, let's say if you were a Honeycomb user and went to a different company and use Honeycomb there, you'd go, I don't need to worry about reading your schema. I'm just going to find a field that measures a number, which could be status code, or it could be latency or duration. And I'm going to draw a box around it because what happens, what we see in bubble up on the screen here is if we had no idea what fields were in this data set or what fields were being emitted by this logs, we just cheated right here because bubble up basically said, these are the here are all the fields that have information contrasting between what you selected and what you didn't. And by the way, we order them by how different they are, whether you use the heat map or whether you use, uh, you know, bubble up on results, but that selection, that selected area and boom, you see all field, all the fields that bubble up thinks are important. Now bubble up is, it has no opinion. Um, selection versus baseline doesn't mean bad versus good, right? It's just a very powerful tool for you to then use your own subjective analysis to say, wait, these three fields, that's interesting. I didn't know they were in the data. And then you mouse over one like Andy was doing in the live demo. And, oh, I didn't know we had customer ID. I didn't know we had build ID. And that second or third or fourth set of questions is actually really only possible on a very wide scale for your entire engineering team if you have better tools. In the same way that, you know, an MRI is a pretty common way to get a part of your body looked at that isn't working. And we all realize that that internal analysis makes it easy for medical professionals to diagnose a problem. Very, very similar without knowing everything, I can point those things out. And, and that whole idea of like cheating with bubble up and figuring out a schema without having to read it and understand it and ask somebody, I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah, that, this one's from our demo environment. So I drew a box around the slow request on the last slide. And uh, this is very clearly, hey, hey, uh, we have one slow endpoint. It is the checkout endpoint. And uh, it's responsible for uh, the slow requests in the box that I drew. So um, <laughs> You know, this came back in three seconds in our demo environment, uh, drawing drawing a uh, bubble up box around those slow requests, and we got our answer. What what endpoint is slow? It's API checkout, uh, and that could be accomplished in thirty seconds to a minute um, if you needed to. So, so hey, yeah, this is all to say analytics, not log search. Uh, you should send your logs or a portion of them to Honeycomb. You can use our utilize our analytics tools like bubble up to find bottlenecks resource contention and slow endpoints like you do in your troubleshooting uh methods day to day and spend your time investigating and fixing issues instead of writing search queries to find th those contentious points um that time you're you're currently spending parsing and querying your data uh could be spent actually fixing the issue and one more point um i, I just want to add on is um 
if you were viewing this webinar and you were not a Honeycomb user, or maybe you're a Honeycomb user and didn't know this fact, that every query that anyone runs in Honeycomb, the results and the view and the graph are stored forever. Your data will expire, you know, maybe after 60 days with your plan. But the history of all the queries is there. And this is one thing that I really wish existed outside of Honeycomb. Sure, bookmarks on search history exist, but the actual cached query isn't there. And we'll tend to use things like this to then go back and look at prior incidents or even learn from each other as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about how to use data better and the direction that things are going. Yeah. Um, I think the world is moving to traces. You know, that's, uh, I think that that path has been set um, pretty clearly by, uh, by most companies and that migration is happening. Um, but, you know, not everything moves at the same time. Even in a company that is tracing, uh, you're going to have, applications that are COTS, that are uh, purchased, that you only have logs for. You're going to have things that you can't affect uh, that you need to, to ingest logs from. And uh, the message we have here is that, you know, you can bring those to Honeycomb and we bring you high cardinality search and analytics to those logs uh, without you needing to go and do tracing. Uh, improving your logging is a journey. Um, there are a lot of companies that are still at the, hey, we only have unstructured logs uh, part of the journey. Um, you know, there's a, a step there that's semi-structured logs, like maybe you've written a parser to take your unstructured logs and send them through Logstash. And now you're pulling out the valuable pieces uh, and you're sending them to an index in Elasticsearch. Uh, maybe you're starting to structure those. Uh, and then to structured logs, maybe you're using a library for your uh, application development that's uh, emitting your logs as JSON blobs instead of as log lines. Um, and then eventually you get to something that's like logs with trace correlation, like maybe you still have some things that are logging, maybe they're being attached to traces span events. There's a lot of permutations of this kind of at the at the end of the journey as you uh, mature into traces. But um, you know, if you still have unstructured logs, you have to make some choices about where you structure those logs for search. Uh, the slowest, most expensive, and least valuable option to do that is to leave them to be structured when you write a complicated search query in a log search tool. Um, that's the time it's going to take you the most time. Like Wild said earlier, you might have something bookmarked or a previous previous art that you can pull on that helps you do that. But the quickest, most valuable time to structure your or to to semi-structure your unstructured logs is uh, when you ingest them into a tool. So uh, sending your log data or a sample set of your log data allows for you to troubleshoot and make use of your data. And you can start using other cool features that exist in the observability space too, like SLOs. So if you're able to get into Honeycomb, we can start talking about other things like SLOs uh, and things like that around them. Yeah, and you know, with all the efforts lately with Open Telemetry, which is a great place to kind of look into if you you're not into that yet. I know a number of my friends on the call know a lot about uh, Open Telemetry and use it. Um, you know, there's linkages between traces and logs, or exceptions and span events and things like that. But one of the easiest things that you can do is if you have a tracing project or are looking at tracing, whatever fields exist in a log event, try to attach them to your trace spans. Honeycomb, it's an advantage because we're, we measure our licensing based on events. So we like you to have massively wide events because we think all the context should be available there. But if you have a log system and you're thinking about tracing or doing it, see if you can't have some parity, like set up a parity project that one of my customers did when they started with Honeycomb, you know, as they're moving to tracing, you know, and they're doing instrumentation, grab those extra fields that would be in the logs so that somebody who's doing trace first debugging actually has uh, all that they need there. So a um, little bit about SLOs. Maybe there are some people here that don't use SLOs or aren't into them yet or think they're too difficult to figure out. Uh, tell us a little bit about them, Andy. Yeah, um, 
just to set a couple of the ter things in terminology that we're going to talk about in the next slide or two. Um, so SLOs are service level objectives, and they're a business agreement expressed in technical terms. Uh, they should really enable proactive discovery of reliability issues. They should help with uh, uh, you know, figuring out when you should put work into uh, reliability engineering and time into uh, shoring up your reliability rather than potentially future development work. And they should be an insight into the reliability figures your team strives for. So there's a few things that make them up. SLIs are service level indicators. Uh, it's a specific and measure of success per event. So uh, in Honeycomb, you really have three options for an SLI. Uh, it can evaluate to true, saying that it matched the criteria and it was successful. False, saying that it matched the criteria and, and was not successful. Uh, or null, saying that the uh, event that came in did not match any of the criteria. So uh, essentially, you know, you, you want true and false events for an endpoint or something like that. And we'll get into an example of that. Uh, an SLO is a service level objective. That's the overarching thing. And it states how often that SLI must succeed over a given time period. So it's going to evaluate trues versus falses. Um, the error budget is the remaining number of failures that are tolerated by an SLO or the remaining percentage of failures tolerated by an SLO. And burn alert uh, essentially signals the error budget is being burned too rapidly. One of the Nice things about burn alert, if you're still on, uh, if you're using kind of traditional uh, monitoring tooling, is that uh, they can generally be very noisy and uh, potentially flappy uh, for their alerts. Burn alerts are really meant to separate, hey, this is a burning issue right now. Uh, you're going to chew through your reliability budget in the next four hours uh, versus, hey, we, you know, you're going to use your reliability budget in the next 24 hours and we need to wake someone up tomorrow morning or we need to uh, send this message to a Slack channel so someone can investigate it when they get into the office tomorrow. And that's one of the key differences of a burn alert versus a traditional sort of uh, alert for, for a, yeah, a threshold. Um, there's some good SLO examples below here. So 99.99% of eligible API, API requests will succeed over a 30-day period. That could be just looking at HTTP response code. Is it a 200? Is it anything other than a 500, 502, that kind of thing? Or something like 99.5% of eligible requests will succeed and complete in under 10 seconds over a 30-day period. Kind of uh, tying into what Wild said earlier, either your system is fast or broken. Um, and that's kind of talking about like, hey, Great, you you returned a request 30 seconds after a user asked for it. They left. They're gone. Uh, no one cares. So, uh, you know, tying the two the two of those together is something that we think is really important for valid and uh, and effective SLOs um, and SLIs. Yeah, thanks, Andy. You know, and one of the things that I I try to remind folks about, um, you know, we're sitting here measuring like uh, we often call it uptime or reliability, and uh, if you are, so here's a, here's a controversial statement. If you are measuring uptime in seconds a month, plan on stopping doing that. What? Most systems that you measure uptime are in, if you want to go to uptime.is, you can figure out what the numbers are. But let's say 99.9% .9 might be 43 minutes of downtime. Yeah, that's the technical measurement of what uptime is. It's mostly in seconds. On this screen, you see some of the things Andy brought up, how often an SLI must succeed over a given time period, meaning instead of looking at good minutes versus bad minutes, because maybe in the middle of the night, you're not doing any investment banking versus in the middle of the day, those minutes are not equal. You can have great uptime if you measure it by minutes and still have uh, a terrible day, so... Um, Honeycomb's users measured them by every single request. Besides, wouldn't you want to be better at requests than at minutes, although you've got to try to do both. Um, the SLO is made up of the service level indicator. And one of the things Andy talked about was eligible events, which is kind of, you know, how does this thing work on the screen, Andy? What's this about? Yeah, so let's say we wanted to create an SLO for that uh, checkout endpoint that we found out was slow. Um, this one is specifically built for that card endpoint, but let's let's assume we wanted to check to uh, create one for the checkout endpoint. 
we'd want to know first that the URL that we're evaluating, that the log line that came in was actually attributed to that checkout service. So we would check to see if the URL, uh, the URL field that came in uh, contained, say, slash API slash checkout or slash checkout, whatever that might be. And then this is looking at those two other fields, right? It's looking at both a successful request and how long did it take. So we're combining the two together. Uh, we're only going to include uh, events and log lines that came in that were for the checkout service or the cart service uh, in this case. And then we're going to say we want HTTP status code less than or equal to 500. That's going to include anything that's a 200, 300, 400 type response code, which is good redirect and, and uh, uh, unauthorized, un unauthenticated kind of thing. Um, and uh, we want anything that completed in under 200 milliseconds to be uh, the thing that we want. And this can apply to log lines. It could apply to traces as well. But uh, you know what I really wanted to stress is you could build this simply based on Apache or Nginx logs or HA proxy logs or ELB logs that are coming into your system. Absolutely. And the function he's using is called a derived column. It's similar to, you know, some different kinds of calculations that exist in other log tools. It runs at query time. It's pretty easy to use. And what he's really done is created a, basically a grade. Have you ever seen the movie um, Gladiator where uh, Joaquin Phoenix is up on the front of the, uh, you know, in the front of the crowd going thumbs up, thumbs down. That's all this is doing is good, bad, good, bad, because now we're being subjective. And then if it doesn't contain the HTTP URL APR cart, it's not evaluated, right? So um, this, I, this allows us to not have to deal with or hope that there's some magic machine learning thing to figure out what normal is. No, this is what we expect, and we're going to measure it. You take all of that and you sum it up, right? Set some goals. Like I would like to succeed at, in this case, this is from our demo, 95% of eligible events from the front end, you know, the, from the front end data set and uh, for the checkout service, and they have to succeed over a certain period of time. And, you know, part of that goal of, of service level objectives is to give people a guide on when we should stop shipping features and start increasing reliability, not when the system is collapsed Oh, those system collapses do happen on occasion. Another cool thing about this is by having an SLO, uh, you will automatically generate a bubble up for the events that show up in that bottom distribution graph. So uh, essentially ev everything you see down there that's in blue met our SLI criteria and anything that's yellow down there, or amber, or whatever color that is, uh, failed our SLI calculation. And what we'll do is automatically build a bubble up below this uh, unfortunately, slides are not tall enough to, to put it in here, but we'll build a bubble up below this uh, that shows you what's different about the failed requests versus the successful. Um, so even coming in here and taking a look at an SLI calculated on your log lines, you'll be able to see the baseline versus, of failure versus successes and what was different about them. Yeah, and what's in this screen, um, you know, a lot of times people think like SLOs are just for SREs or other jobs that have an S in the title. Um, but, you know, I feel like this is a really good status screen. Uh, you know, you might check four or five things when you go into work, right? You might check Slack or Teams or whatever chat you use. Um, you probably check email, maybe check a dashboard or some, you know, networking diagram. But if you're a service owner or a developer, check your SLO screen here because it tells you up to the minute how it is. But also that time picker that's in the screen shows you the heat map, but also shows you the bubble up below for that time period. So you can say, okay, we're cool, but how are we doing right now? Who's having a bad day? And just being able to be on top of that something that we really like at Honeycomb, and we find that most customers do as well. All right. So most people know how to, if you're doing tracing, most people know how to get traces over to Honeycomb because they're probably using some bespoke libraries or possibly open telemetry. But what do we do about logs? Yeah. So uh, if you're already using a tool to uh, parse and structure your logs, like uh, a grok mechanism in Logstash, or uh, you've got a Splunk forwarder and you've got Cribble set up. Um, that's the easiest way to send log data to Honeycomb. So with 
Logstash, you'll be able to uh, use the HTTP output uh, and essentially transform your Logstash output to a format Honeycomb can understand. We've got it all documented in the link there. Um, uh, and basically, it's just fork your Logstash output and send a copy of it over to Honeycomb. That's great. And like, if you just wanted to check out what this is like, you could sign up for our free tier, add Honeycomb as an output to either Cribble or Logstash and uh, try it out and see what happens and see if you get valuable insight into it. And, you know, there's uh, probably a few minutes of your day to configure the output there and, and get that running. Um, a little more on Cribble and Splunk. So Cribble is a, a, a product suite that can help you reduce the volume of data you're emitting to Splunk. Um, but it also supports other outputs and destinations for your data that it's consuming for you. Uh, so one of the things you can do with it is you can configure a destination that is Honeycomb. It'll take your logs off your systems, send it, uh, structure it, send it over to your uh, Honeycomb instance. And then uh, there's, so the add Honeycomb as a destination Cribble is a link there and it actually goes to Cribble's website and their documentation. And then there's some other methods. If you haven't written any sort of structure for your logs yet, uh, you can use Honeytail. Uh, it, we have a preset level of uh, of logs like uh, Apache Access, Nginx, HA Proxy, that kind of stuff that exists for Honeytail. Uh, we can consume kind of common uh, log types out of the box um, and, and essentially configure it, give it uh, your Honeycomb API key and it sends it on. Uh, we have a Fluent D integration. Uh, you can deploy Kubernetes, Kubernetes agent that lives uh, alongside your pod and basically will uh, take things in and send them on to Honeycomb. And uh, with AWS, uh, if uh, you want to click on that link there real quick, support AWS th services through CloudWatch logs. Uh, I don't know if this will pop up. Um, basically, on our website, we have a list of all the different things that you can send. The key here is that if you can send to CloudWatch logs or CloudWatch metrics, we can probably consume it. Um, and uh, here's just like a, a list on our website of everything inside of AWS that we can consume. And of course, the most common one is going to be ELB and things like that. Now, if we go back to the webinar, there's a quick little diagram that uh, I'm making, making wild dance around his screen sharing uh, capabilities here. So uh, there's a quick little diagram that shows how we do it. Um, basically from a CloudWatch log group over to a Kinesis data fire hose, we do some data transformation using a Lambda and it gets forwarded onto Honeycomb at that point. So uh, that's that's how our integrations work. And there is a quick setup. Uh, we're just seeing a blank. There we go. Um, there's a quick deploy using Terraform or CloudFormation for that, uh, that sets up uh, any of the supported ones that we had in the list there. Awesome. Um, I can't imagine there would be any questions because this webinar has been so full of information. But if there are, you know, as we said before, uh, seriously, uh, type them in the chat. Um, you can't, like, this is a Zoom meeting. So you could go off of mute and talk to us. But I'm going to put something on the screen. Take a photo with your phone. Um, uh, there's a survey. I'd really like you to do a survey because, you know, it helps us understand whether these things are good, worth your time or whatever. Um, just hit that with your, th with your thing. There's a survey there. The secret word is logging. If you don't actually have a Honeycomb t-shirt, we will definitely hook you up. Um, and uh, any questions popping up in here yet? Even uh, if you do have a Honeycomb t-shirt, I'm pretty sure we'll send you another one. Probably because it's, you know, you need an extra one. Um, Steve Prezenica, I thought you were just blown away by meeting me and not bubble up, but uh, yeah, so Steve's comment is really nice about uh, being able to find correlating attributes, which is cool. Um, what what questions do you sometimes see, Andy, that customers will ask us about logs? Uh, it's a lot of um, uh, how to get it ingested. And uh, I think if, if you've already used Honeycomb for traces, um, you kind of know the bubble ups there and you sort of figure out what you're going to be able to do with it. Um, I think that uh, really the um, one of the big things I see is like, hey, we have a, a team that runs mostly off the shelf software and they only have logs uh, or something like that. And how do we consume that and get them some something out of uh, 
uh, out of honeycomb. What about you, Wild? What do you see? Yeah, you yeah. First of all, often it's oh, how do I search my logs, and I have to say, you don't start there. But when you get to the raw data view, which is, uh, you know, pretty useful as far as when you finally get down there, it's got a little bit of a you know field field of search. But one of the things I often get is like, well, my logs aren't that structured. Like, how can I make them more structured so I can do some of that cool analysis there wild that you guys talk about? Um, if you have ever used, I'll say Splunk probably has the most sophisticated search language that existed because it kind of came up with it. And it was really based on, you know, just the piping idea of, of, of bash, but derived columns, um, they're a function in honeycomb. Um, Honeycomb's backend is this brilliant um, high cardinality column database, which is why it does analytics fast. But derived columns use some of the same kind of functions that you would expect. And a derived column will let you make a brand new field. Let's say, for example, you ingested a log that had like, let's say, a, uh, a severity field, just like a standard syslog. Well, a lot of stuff in standard syslogs really isn't totally awesome for doing analytics on. But let's say you had one that had severity. Um, and the field and 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 the data coming into Honeycomb were three fields: message, timestamp, and something else. The derived columns will let you do simple things like maybe regex out um, something out of a field and put it in there. Do more complicated things like um, some fancy math, doing time operations, or allowing you to. Um, kind of not really enrich, but extract information out of those logs that other people can use. Oh, everybody can do that. Yeah, except for those derived columns also show up inside of Bubble Up. So those brand new columns that you just built yesterday will show up there and people will be able to discover them in a really great way. So. Yeah, and important to note that derived columns are evaluated at query or bubble up time they aren't they you don't need to re-index your data you don't need to do anything like that we evaluate it on the fly when you build a query and i think it's super valuable to call those out because uh you know one of the one of the things you can get a lot of detail out of that can be lost is like a query string on a on an http request and you can pull out like number of products you can pull out a bunch of stuff that uh that you would have to write a parsing rule for, uh, and you can write a derived column for that. Uh, I did. We, see... we got Rob Campbell there. Yeah. Rob Campbell's got a question there. All right, yes. Andy, what's the biggest challenge that you see? Not the most smallest, but the biggest. What do you see in customers when switching them from the mindset of logging to the importance of tracing? How much pushback do you tend to endure? Technically, it's two questions, Rob, but we'll allow it. Uh, so I think. I see two things a lot. One is uh, people that have experienced poor sampling in the past and they don't want to do tracing because they're like, I'm never going to get the traces that I actually want to see anyway. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's uh, fighting against that former experience can be uh, pretty difficult. Um, it's, a, it's a big challenge if someone's already made up their mind, of course, that, hey, this thing isn't going to work because I'm, I'm not going to be able to get what I need out of it. Uh, and two, um, you know, I think I come from the DevOps space. So do you, so do you, Rob? Um, and the we had we had a similar kind of like, hey, we're changing the way we do things, um, or like we're rebranding and thinking about things a, a bit differently from you know 2010 to 2015 uh, as we as we tried to get customers and companies to to change the way they're doing things. And I shouldn't end it at 2015 because it continues today. But uh, the uh, you know, that cultural and process change and getting people to buy in when they can just uh, type in like uh, log dot line and and pump something out to their console. Uh, it's so easy. Uh, and just getting them to realize that something like open telemetry, although you've got the like, you know, the first hour of getting things uh, up and running, getting it, getting it, the libraries into your application. Uh, because it's going to give you the idea of distributed tracing, um, you know, getting them to the the realization of value on that can be 
uh, one of the hardest things. Uh, do you see other things wild? What yeah, do I do. Um, so th there isn't right now, let's say the command line visual equivalent to tracing sitting in your IDE. It exists in your IDE for logs because you can get console output and then you run something through a test system and you get console output. But um, so tracing itself might be new for engineers. And then the whole problem with people doing sampling the wrong way makes engineers not trust tracing because like when they typed in the correlation ID, it's not there. But um, now in the world of um, more distributed services, I almost said microservices, I just said microservices. Now in that world, you are a, your request is a part of a lot bigger operation. And using tracing in the development cycle, um, I've seen like my friend Steve on the call here, his company uh, uses it in their dev cycle so their engineers can see how their service interacts with every other service. Um, and, and I think he once said, yeah, I can peer into how another service is reacting, even if I'm not responsible to it, which is pretty cool. Um, I think there's going to be some work on helping engineers visualize more of that. But I kind of look at logs as um, logs are bones, right? Bones without uh, without ligaments are just a pile, right? Ligaments connect bones and traces are kind of like that. Connect the whole skeleton together and make it easier to see. And we make a really great tool to, uh, to uh, deal with traces as well. So uh, just a reminder, we have a couple things coming up next that are just not showing on the screen because I got to click an extra button. Is it here? Are we cool? Or is not it all? Yet. Let's try this again. Safari is uh, not behaving. But we've got uh, Bethany posted some things in the corner um, of there as far as new things that are uh, uh, events that are coming up at Honeycomb. Thank you for uh, being such a great partner, Andy. Um, there's always workshops on in, implementing, instrumenting your code, getting set up with observability. Um, the folks that run these are often our training team, our field team, some of our great evangelists and uh, and DevRel people that you might know. Um, whether it's easy stuff or hard stuff, we try to educate folks as well. So please um, check it out. Thank everybody for hanging out. Uh, take the survey, get a shirt. Have an awesome weekend, and uh, you know, keep on uh, keep on logging. Thanks, everyone. See Thank you. Later.